not to make this comparison, but I'm going to make the comparison because why not? It was consensus that Ripple sucked four years ago and five years ago and six years ago. And then it was true. It just sucked. It just never got adoption. It never got picked up. It never, it never worked. And so it's not improbable that ETH becomes the Ripple of this cycle where everybody thinks it's going to pump because it pumped really hard last cycle. I mean, Ripple pumped so hard in 2017, it ripped everybody's face off. And then in 2021, it literally did nothing. When you have all these people that have made, that have made money on Solana, I don't know why they would come back to ETH. This episode is brought to you by Perennial Finance, the on-chain DeFi primitive redesigning derivatives for the DeFi native. You'll hear more about Perennial later in the show. Welcome back to another episode of 1000X. We are back online after our in-person discussion at Gas, which was really fun, honestly, John. I really enjoyed speaking with you in front of that audience. That was a good, it was a good test of our ability to perform in front of a couple hundred people. <laughs> it was awesome. It was, uh, thank you everybody who came. Uh, the room kind of filled up early into our conversation and we had some good vibes in there. It, it was good to, it was good to see people actually showing up for a crypto conference, feeling bullish, um, feeling excited to be in the space for a change after a very painful bear market. Yeah. I thought that was a really nice indication of where we're at. It was also very institutional just in general, the quality of the people that I talked to, the quality of the builders, the quality of the investors, everybody seemed to really understand and know what's going on in the space more than they have in the past. The market is definitely getting a little bit smarter, which is either a good thing or a bad thing, depending on how you look at it. I mean, it's always, always nice to be trading against a stupid market. So I think it's, <laughs> it's a little bit of a double-edged sword, but it was good to see at least the industry itself seems to have grown up a non-trivial, non-trivial amount over the last two years. I think we've learned a lot of lessons. I didn't see too many shorts in the audience or on stage. Always good. One thing that struck me about the conference, Avi, was that you had people in there who were, you know, it, it feels like the last couple of bear markets have filtered out grifters, filtered out, you know, the get rich quick scammer type. And this crew seemed like a genuinely curious more more institutional crowd because it, that's the nature of this conference. It's uh it's for you know, I think tradfi. It's like the bridge between tradfi and crypto. But the people there were you know, not like hardcore anarchist Bitcoin class of two thousand eleven crypto enthusiasts, but more like, you know, maybe they they got they got their feet wet in two thousand twenty one, uh, and stuck with it kind of enthusiasts and a mixture of tech people and also you know, finance guys who are trying to, you know, basically bridge capital from TradFi into crypto, which I thought was pretty interesting. I, I actually, we were talking about this just before the podcast. Um, you know, a, after after the conference was over, we went to the Ethereum dinner. There was an Ethereum dinner and a Solana dinner. And, you know, maybe it's because I fudded Solana $180 ago, but we didn't get the look on the Solana dinner. I'm sorry about that, Avi. I'm sorry you got dragged into my... Uh, my shit show there. Look, we, we, uh, you, you, you fixed it. You got in at 30. I did. I did. Not enough. Never enough, unfortunately. But um, I think the, the Ethereum dinner was interesting because, you know, correct me if I'm wrong here, but it feels like there's a lot going on on that chain and a lot of hatred and FUD and fear going on inside of crypto about ETH. Like ETH should be performing right now and it's not. We got a little look behind the scenes at what's coming at the dinner. It's it's pretty interesting. Yeah, I, I, I do think that ETH has been really destroyed. I mean, I, I, it's not a think. I know I can see it on the chart. You can just see it from the community. You can see it across the board. I mean, you have all these L2s that are struggling really hard to get to get any uptick. Uh, you know, obviously, you have Arbitrum Optimism, ZK Sync, but, but people have really just forgotten about ETH, I think, in, I think in a big way. And my personal view on this is that it's really hard for that to change unless you get an ETH ETF approved. I was unfortunately incorrect 
on my last calls, I thought that post Bitcoin ETF, the narrative would switch very quickly to the ETH ETF, which it did for about six days. And then everybody decided that the ETH ETF wasn't going to get approved. And so ETH just started trading really poorly again. I think the issue is right now, ETH has always been the chain where the real projects build and the real projects go. The DeFi projects of the world, the uh, you know the RWA projects of the world, they all like Ethereum because Ethereum signals a little bit of institutional uh, bent. It has a little bit of an institutional bent to it. It has a little bit more of a grounded, less pie in the sky bent because it's been around so long and it's it's the number two. And the reality is that that's just not what's interesting to people right now. That's not what's interesting to investors. There's just nobody putting their money on things that are being built on ETH. And that's making it really hard for ETH to succeed. It's also one of those things where the risk profile of ETH is way too similar to Bitcoin right now. It's you're looking, if you can imagine Bitcoin at 150K and ETH at 10K, the difference in return isn't that big between those two in the eyes of crypto people. The difference between a 2X and a 3X kind of, well, you know, how much does this really matter? Now, when you have meme coins popping off 100X everywhere, that's going to dampen your interest in a coin like ETH. And so I'm I'm getting increasingly nervous about about ETH. I, you know, I was I was bullish. I was bullish for a bit in the in the beginning there, as the ETH ETF narrative went away, I stepped away, and now I'm thinking, I don't even know when I would step back in at this point. I don't know if you have a different take. Yeah, I have a slightly different take. I mean, I'm a long term ETH bag holder. Uh, I got in at a good price, and I, I just haven't really sold. It's the pretty much the only token I've done right uh, for the, for the long haul. Um, I would say, you know, I've, I've had some short term wins and other things, and Bitcoin I've done right as well. But ETH I did really right, and I think the reason why I've held ETH through this cycle, there's a bit of laziness attached to just holding something and never selling it, um, but also because I believed it was good diversification from Bitcoin. I'm bullish as I'm bullish as ever Bitcoin for all the reasons we've hammered ad nauseum in this podcast but eth i thought you know it's sort of like the de facto l1 where serious people build serious projects just like you said um solana has really shown up and become a performant place to deploy a decentralized application uh and serious people are building there for sure and that's i guess it's kind of scary for eth but at the same time I'm, i think maximalism is stupid like when i bull post eth on twitter the solana people like they say really nasty things, but I think it's possible to envision a scenario where both tokens drastically outperform Bitcoin. But, you know, both of them are not, not they, they haven't breached their all-time highs from the previous cycle yet. Bitcoin has. You know, both of these alt ones can definitely go up quite a lot from here. I think there's a scenario where Bitcoin rallies, Bitcoin does a 2x and ETH does a 5x. And here's that scenario for you, Avi. The scenario is... Um, you develop a meme coin, meme coin ecosystem on base that attracts people. It's already kind of happening. So you have two casinos now. Like it, the win isn't the only show in Vegas, right? Like th there's a couple of places where you can go gamble. It doesn't have to all be on Solana forever, right? So you get your meme coin casino. Then uh, something that nobody's talking about right now is games. And you get like uh, Ansem shilled us the parallel trading card game back in November. What if one of those things just lands on ETH and you know, all those projects are kind of distributed across different L1s? But I think ETH has a couple interesting ones, including that one uh, that could pop off. Those are kind of call options. Ultimately, I think the big one is TradFi settling stuff on chain, tokenized funds. Uh, you and I both agree that crypto is a better way to move value and spend value than TradFi Rails. And I think that tokenized funds are a massive use case that nobody's really paying attention to. BlackRock's Biddle Fund, I think it's at 300 million in assets now. And then the final thing is uh, the ETH ETF. Like BlackRock filed an application for an ETH ETF. The final approval is due from the SEC this May. Their record for ETF approvals is like 800 yes, one no. They know what they're fucking doing. 
and you like you make the biggest returns when you buy stuff that everyone hates and you're right um you don't make the biggest returns when you lift like f- like hyped amazing narratives after they've just 10 x I, I don't know. So I think this might be a good contrarian opportunity. Um, yeah. I, look at the end, at the end of the day, the issue is that there's just no narrative for Ethereum. And so you have all these potential narratives that you just outlined, I think very well that could materialize. So you could have the RWA narrative come up, which is, is very is very reasonable because I do think that if institutions are going to work with a chain, it's very likely going to be ETH first and then everything else second. But that's just not what people are interested in right now, and it's not it's not driving any any real value to the chain. So I think this is this is more of a slow burn. And then again, when you step back, it just goes back to the risk reward. At the end of the day, everything in trading is risk reward. What's the upside versus versus what's the downside? And the issue is that there's no pie in the sky case for ETH. So the way that I think about this is I thought that, I just named a couple pie in the sky cases. I, I but I don't in, in terms of price, right? I think ten thousand, fifteen thousand. That, that's not that's not enough. To get people interested. So the way that I view this is, if you want ETH exposure, the best way to do it is two two things. One, you either buy really high end NFTs that are doing that are doing well, or two, you're buying the L twos on top of ETH that you think are going to benefit. So for example, base could be a catalyst for ETH. If base really picks up, then then it could be a catalyst. But what we're seeing is that Solana is doing such a good job at recapturing flows. So over the last two weeks, there were a lot of flows that went out to base. But then over the last five days, a lot of those flows left base and went right back to Solana. So there's no there's no stickiness right now among the ETH L2s. And the concept of decentralization just doesn't seem to be entering into people's minds in the same way that it did in 2021. There's a lot less idealism this time around in this market than there was four years ago. I think four years ago, you still had a little bit, I mean, not a little bit. Four years ago, you had a much larger libertarian bent to crypto. Now you don't really have anything. So if I'm thinking about constructing a portfolio, if you are bullish on ETH, I still don't think you buy ETH outright. You buy ETH beta that can do well in in a in a, in a couple of different in a couple of different scenarios, and you just have to avoid the trap of getting stuck in ETH because what's possible is that all of this stuff comes together in two years. But if Bitcoin's going down when RWAs are taking off on ETH, I don't think that's enough to keep ETH high. That's the issue. Totally agree. You touched on something in the middle of that, though, that I think is valuable to dissect, which is that um, they're the ETH bag holders, the ETH ecosystem people, they're getting it's not just that they aren't in the right nightclub at the right party right now, which is Solana, right? It's more that that's happening and they're getting decimated on their NFTs. Their board apes are going to zero. They're pudgy penguins. They're squiggles. All of this like the meme coins, the 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 moon shots of the previous cycle, the moon birds, uh, as it were, right? They're all they're all just either getting rugged or getting blurred down to zero. And I think the only reason why the ether rocks and the crypto punks have survived this onslaught is because the token standard for those projects predates ERC seven twenty one, which is what blur effectively prices, right? So you have this engine for effectively flooring NFTs that's just destroying value across the ETH ecosystem at the very same time as like people are thousand Xing their cash on shark cat, cat face, and some cat, moon dog, dog moon uh, on Solana. And that's great. But <clears throat> again, I, I feel like the best time to get into these narratives is on the lows, not on the highs. And, you know, if ETH is hated, maybe this is the time where you should be looking to add. Equally, like all of this me- like meme money that's theoretically getting made on Solana, um, you know, I'm 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 heavily invested now in, in Joe Bowden and <laughs> I am I am over invested and I need to get out. <laughs> over over invested in Joe Bowden and I have a little little uh allocation to some monkey haircuts some shark cat and a few others it's kind of like 
it's cool to watch those coins go up, but I haven't sold anything. And I, I, if I, if everybody went to go take profit, we'd see very quickly that these hundred X's or thousand X's on paper, are actually more like two to three X's for the early people and negative 50% for the late people. So it's a, it, we're in a tricky part of the cycle here. The volatility is picking up. It's unclear what the next narrative is going to be. And if you're right, Avi, if all of these big ETH wins land in the middle of like, like after another bear market, then who cares? But if they land in the next year while we're still pumping, then it could be ridiculous. I, I, ju- I just don't know. This episode is brought to you by Perennial Finance. Perennial is quickly becoming one of the go-to derivatives platforms and liquidity layers for all of DeFi. So let me tell you a little bit about them. There are kind of three things you need, right? When you're thinking about a place and a platform to trade on. First one, great trade execution. Second one, low fees. And third, of course, an on-chain permissionless platform. And Perennial nails all three of those buckets. With the launch of Perennial V2, they've made all of that possible by introducing a ton of new features, such as faster oracles, which reduce trade execution to seconds, lower fees, competing with major centralized exchanges and minimizing fees for both takers and makers. Fully modular markets, which allow the protocol to support any price feed out there. And fourth, cash settled, right? The trades are cash settled in USD, not in crypto. Perennial allows you, the trader, to gain access to deeper liquidity with only a fraction of the TVL. How it works is that Perennial enables a two-sided market made up of both traders and liquidity providers, right? Traders deposit the assets to get levered exposure, while liquidity providers providers provide these pools of capital to earn fees for taking the other side of the trader position. Perennial allows you to trade crypto, perps, FX, and coming soon, NFTs and more. Backed by some of the best investors in the industry, Perennial is a must check out platform if you're a crypto trader. Go check them out by clicking the link in the description. Give 1000x some credit. Go check out Perennial. You're going to love them. All right, let's get back to the show. Yeah, I, and I think it's I think it's hard to, hard, hard to say. Because the the reality is that now, when you have all these people that have made that have made money on Solana, I don't know why they would come back to ETH. At this have they crystallized it though? But even if they crystallize it, maybe they just take it out, or they wait for some for something else, right? There's no reason, especially now, because it's it's not like you're stuck on Solana in the same way that you were back in the day. I mean, there's so many off ramps, you just go straight, straight to any exchange and you can deposit your Solana USDC that you've, that you've minted. They'll, that, that value will leave Solana if there's something to buy on ETH. There just isn't right now. Like half of the value in Solana is probably wealth that came in from ETH and Bitcoin, you know? That, yeah, that, 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 that for sure. The question is, has, has it been lost? Has it been lost forever? And my bet is that a non-trivial percentage of it is yes. We just really we just need BlackRock to file the CTF, man, and I mean approve the CTF. That that that's it. At, at the end of the day, that's the only thing that's going to save the ETH BTC ratio right now, unfortunately, because what you have, what 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 you just have is you just have no meaningful adoption of anything that's being built that's being built on ETH, except for all the shit going on base. Um, but I, I take your point, right? Like I, I'm not going to for, for the for everyone listening, I'm not denying that it's bad right now on ETH. The, the ETH dinner was a little bit gloomy, um, even at an otherwise very happy conference. But like, I'm just going to say here, uh, let's say that like it's consensus that ETH sucks. It's consensus that the ETF is going to get denied. It's consensus that Solana is the, the new layer one where you build, where serious people build serious stuff and serious people build fun stuff. Like what if, what if the SEC just gets daddied by Larry Fink again and an ETF for ETH gets approved well, no one expects it or is paying attention. Like, I, and then a bunch of retail that that isn't on crypto Twitter that doesn't know any of this stuff or care about crypto natives, like na- uh, native narratives, is just like, yeah, let's buy some ETH. That's you don't want to be short ahead of that. Like, it's it's a contrarian. Yeah, I, I I agree. I agree. You don't you don't want to be short. <laughs> you probably don't want to don't want to short ETH. And I also think that spread trades are really mid curve in this market right now, just because I think there's a lot of alpha in, in directional and in, in pick, pick, picking a direction and sticking with it. I think my, my hesitation with it just comes from the fact that even if we do get a pop from the ETF, it's probably going to be a short lived one because there, there's only, there, there's only so much allocation. I, I also do think that there, 
you know, a, a, a lot of people in the TradFi world are very comfortable with BTC and they're still less, co- they're just less comfortable with the idea, with, with the idea of ETH still to this day. And not to make a bad, I mean, not, 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 not to make this comparison, but I'm going to make the comparison because why not? It was consensus that Ripple sucked four years ago and five years ago and six years ago. And then it was true. It just sucked. It just never got adoption. It never got picked up. It never, it never worked. And so it's not improbable that ETH becomes the ripple of this cycle where everybody thinks it's going to pump because it pumped really hard last cycle. I mean, ripple pumped so hard in 2017, it ripped everybody's face off. And then in 2021, it literally did nothing. Yeah. It went to like $3, didn't it? Yeah. Right. But it went from, I mean, it basically 10 X and that's it, which is nothing. And, you know, I mean, I, 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 I I just personally think that you have a scenario where ETH is ETH is sort of caught between this rock and a hard place. The only thing that can save it, I think, are, is a really, really, really phenomenal user experience on an L2. So you need Arbitrum Optimism, ZK, to just have the best user experience by far. You have to have it beat Solana. You have to have people come back over. And the other thing is that Solana has now proven that you it's one of the biggest moats, just to take a step back. What was one of the biggest moats for ETH? It was the fact that you had to program in Solidity and the vast majority of people in crypto knew how to program in Solidity and they weren't programming in Move and they weren't you know, programming in, in, in other languages. Now, that doesn't matter. So many people know how to program on Solana. So many people know how to program with different, with different languages that are in crypto. There are a lot of people coming into this space that are developers that never need, you never need to learn Solidity anymore. You don't need to learn it anymore. If you want to launch a project, you can just stick with a language that's more, that's more common. Right. Mm. And so that moat has been eroded. And then also the moat for the EVM has been eroded because so, so much volume is happening off of, off of Ethereum. So no longer has the moats that it used to have, which makes me think that it's a now just a trading asset. I mean, you can long it when you're bullish on it for the next two weeks, for the next four weeks, but I'm just long-term more bearish on Ethereum than I am on Solana. And this is what I actually said. I said this on the panel and that was maybe the most talked about statement. I mean, everybody else came up to me after and said, why are you so bullish on Solana? And you're not, you're not so bullish on ETH. And this is coming from somebody, I mean, I was never, I was never a Solana guy. I was not somebody out there from the beginning that said, oh, Solana, 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 Solana. But what I've just seen is that ETH has had an inability to execute and the L2s that are building on ETH also haven't been executing particularly well, no matter, no matter what they say. And so you kind of have to reevaluate your opinion at a certain point and, and realize, look, these guys haven't been able to bring over real volumes and real people to their platforms. Solana seems to be doing a, a better job at this and it's captured the zeitgeist of retail. And the reality is at the end of the day, institutions go where retail is because that's where the money's made. Do you really think, like, Solana is definitely doing an amazing job right now. Not going to debate that. Do you really think ETH isn't bringing over real volumes and real people? I I think, like, if you look at DeFi volumes, let's talk DeFi for a second. So here's another way, just very quickly, how, you know, some of my friends are on-chain traders, like serious professional robot on-chain traders. Here's some anecdotes from the on-chain world of providing liquidity and DeFi. Um... Apparently, the whole MEV sandwich party on Ethereum ended uh, when a major, let's call it a major on and off chain market maker decided to just lay off their risk on chain at mids, right? They're just sort of like showing up at every market that used to be super wide and they've tightened it up. They're just like, well, we're we're long doge from this centralized trade we did so we're just going to offer doge and mids on chain and apparently that's just killing a lot of the fat and the edge on ethereum meanwhile solana is just this like crazy money party right now uh if you're if you're there to like make uh whiff and Bowden and all this fun stuff um so part of me thinks that but that that says nothing about like the volumes or the people like volumes on uniswap are enormous i i haven't I don't have this committed to memory, but I think they're outpacing any other decks. I'm not saying there's no volume, but if you look, for example, if you look at the TVL 
of Ethereum, and then you look at the volume on Ethereum, it still pales in comparison to 21. Despite the fact that Bitcoin's past, you know, Bitcoin passed all time highs, you're just not seeing the activity that you would expect. And things like Solana are seeing much higher volumes and activities than you saw in, in 21. 20, you know, not, 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 not much higher, but it's, it's trending, it's trending up, it's trending up nicely. And I, th I think that what you're, what you're left with today is you're, 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 you're left with this bad, this bad taste in your mouth of, okay, well, ETH just isn't, is, is not doing as well as it was doing three, four years ago in terms of projects, in terms of volume, in terms of activity. When you would think that in a crazy market like today, in an insane market like today, you would think that it would have spread more. Now, maybe, maybe, you know, to take a step back, maybe I'm wrong about why. And it's just that we still haven't seen retail come in, 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 in full force. So it's just, it's just that crypto people aren't interested in using, in using Ethereum. They, but once the retail starts to come back in, which I think probably you would need Bitcoin closer to hundred K flirting with hundred K to bring, to bring people back in, then maybe, you know, you, you see, you see volume, volume, come back, come back to ETH. But what's, what's kind of interesting to me is that even today with prices at, at all time highs and people really excited and, and things happening in the, in the crypto world, the, your average market participant, you know, your, your average market participant that was around in 2021 isn't here right now. They're still, they're still not here. And I can't really put a finger on why, and I don't really know if they're going to come back, but I do think it boils down to, if I had to take a guess, the fact that it's very, very, very difficult to replicate the COVID effect. It's just super difficult to replicate that effect where everybody's inside. Nobody has anything to do. Everybody's online 24 seven. It's going to be hard to get back to where we were, where, where we were in 2021. So you have to at least think about the idea that it's, there might not actually be retail coming back this cycle. And so if that's the case, then what do you want to, what do you want to focus on? At least until we get to hundred K or, you know, things, things get absolutely, absolutely nuts is you just, you're focusing on the crypto native stuff and you're focusing on Bitcoin. And I think this has been said ad nauseum, but I still think that this is true because you, you, you actually, at this point, you can't really make a strong bet on one retail is on one retail is going to come back in. Yeah. I mean, you can, you can front run meme coins and that's just on chain degeneracy, but you can't make a bet on, it's harder to make a bet on NFTs, games, some of the more serious stuff. I mean, to your point about Bitcoin, though, I am hearing some interesting anecdotes from the oil market. They're not they're not going away, these anecdotes. The recent one, and I heard this from a very credible source, is that PDVSA, which is the, um, let's just call it a, a major Venezuelan state-owned oil entity, is offering, and refining as well, uh, offering discounts on export cargoes if the buyer pays in bitcoin instead of in dollars seriously um, yeah well, i mean is, I, I mean they're sanctioned right that's why yeah that's right they're sanctioned um but like it, it, they can't they basically can't get banked with dollars anymore the venezuela the sanctioned oil trade like half of the fucking oil that that's an exaggeration at least 20% of the world's oil comes from sanctioned countries. So that's more than 20 million barrels a day, barrels, 42 gallons. Like it's a, it's a, it's an ocean of oil every day comes from sanctioned entities. They have no dollar banking. The, the U S has just sanctioned up the wazoo. So if you want to have, if you're Venezuela and you want to sell your oil and you want to receive dollars, you have to wait 17 business days for those dollars to hit a shell company owned by a shell company owned by a shell company, or you can get your Bitcoin in 15 minutes, right? So, okay, maybe retail is not coming back to fuck around on Aptos um, or play games on Avalanche, but you know there is money coming into this. It's just different money, you know? But I mean, that sounds like it's just all Bitcoin money, no? Yeah, exactly. Bitcoin money. Okay. So I think that that's that's probably that's probably the main difference, right? Is that this this money is very unlikely to go travel to other sectors. Correct. And the, the BlackRock ETF 
the Bitcoin ETF money isn't going to go travel to ETH either. But then, you know, you were the one shouting at me saying that eventually it, it does move over. So I don't know. I think maybe the ETH community is just too wounded from the NFT carnage and the, the lack of sandwich fun and all this other stuff to, to really get excited about degeneracy. And the Solana mafia is on a high, um, you know, for obvious reasons. That's I, I was sort of screaming that it was going to rotate over to altcoins in general from the people that already that already hold BTC. But what's clear to me is that it's it just rotates. It, it crypto natives are just going to rotate to meme coins, right? I mean, or, or crypto natives going to buy DeFi. Now, the, the one thing that is maybe changing my mind a little bit kind of happened today. I mean, we'll see what happens with the airdrop from uh, Wormhole and the airdrop from Athena was was really good. And so you are going to have these large events where real products that are building real stuff actually are, is, you know, it's generating interest now. And so I am watching this closely because if Athena really takes off, if Wormhole really takes off and it does well and it's sustained, then it might cat catalyze and move towards real projects. And I mean, you look, you look at Maker, Maker's done, Maker's done very well. So what could happen and what we could see just as a, you know, play devil's advocate against myself is that people t take profits in meme coins into these more interesting assets. And then that catalyzes a run on meme coins and a booming of capital in projects that actually might do well, hmm. right? Might do, might, might do good, might do good for crypto. So there potentially one thing that could happen is dog with hat sells off by 80, 80%. But it sells off by eighty percent because all of that capital is moving into "quote unquote" safer assets, which you would probably expect at some point. I mean, also question for you, Avi: Does an airdrop actually kickstart an ecosystem? Like, will wormhole take off because of because of the airdrop? I mean, yeah, it's possible. I mean, I think more more importantly for wormhole is that if you're not allocated to Solana right now, you probably should be allocated to Solana right now because it's going to create a lot of wealth for people. And everybody's going to take that wormhole money and they're going to buy monkey getting haircut or whatever. And that's probably going to be a very big boon for the Solana ecosystem. It's kind of the same way that when AVAX announced that they were going to have a fund dedicated to buying meme coins on AVAX, everybody wrote it off. And then all the meme coins on AVAX did really well. That's how I feel about wormhole. It's, it's telegraphed. Everybody sort of knows this, but I genuinely don't think people are, because they're, they're hat. There hasn't been enough front running flows yet. Hmm. When's the wormhole airdrop? Uh, that's a good good question. While we're talking about Solana, one of my favorite analysts on the Solana sort of ecosystem is this guy, Zero X Gumshoe. You should you should go check out Zero X Gumshoe's Twitter account. He or she or whoever did a an interesting analysis of airdrop price action. Um <laughs> Basically, what you're supposed to do is farm those airdrops that you know are coming, slosh a bunch of money around in those in those systems, wormhole, whatever, get your airdrop, sell it immediately, and then rebuy down like 80%. Um, that's a good trade. So don't don't hang on and get caught holding the bag. Uh, go to 0x Gumshoe's account and learn how to trade an airdrop. I wish I had that last cycle. Okay. <laughs> that's, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's interesting and, and fair. I'll, I'll go... Uh... Go go check that out. Zero X Gumshoe. What a good good shout out, Jenna. See, I follow Solana Twitter. I like it. I got some Solana. It's fun. The one thing that that I was kind of curious about though is like it, it in this in this environment where you know, you talked about the barbell strategy, Avi, where you just hold Bitcoin for obvious reasons and then you play the meme coin casino for obvious reasons. Like do you th are you starting to lose hope that any of the stuff in between those two extremes is going to start to emerge and, and generate value? And if it seems to, are we going to be too late? Like, is it is it going to be the 2028 cycle where where real shit starts to take off? I'm kind of I'm getting worried. I don't necessarily think that it's going to be that long. I think that we are going to see real things take off. I just don't know if you're going to be able to make money on that. In the you know in in, 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 in that's why people are so interested in meme coins because that that's where that's where the money's made i mean for example an rwa platform that tokenizes a bunch of assets and that it, it enables enables the trading 
of all these assets. I mean, how much does a platform that issues tokenized products, how much is that actually going to be worth is a question. Just the platform for facilitating because it's going to be very, very little. But the uh, sorry, by platform, you mean the the application or the L2? I, I think the, the each L1 is what benefits. I think the like, I believe in the fat protocol thesis. I don't think it's been disproven. If anything, I think it's been proven. And if you have to, if you have these tokenization rails getting built, then that just means like millions of new ETH wallets getting lit up and funded with ETH and millions of institutions having to buy ETH to support all of this, pay gas. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I, I, I disagree just because I think that a lot of these applications are going to happen on L2s and there's just going not going to be that much demand for ETH that's generated because these L2s are going to have very, very low fees. And so then I, then I go one step further and I think about the applications themselves. Are the applications going to generate any value? I mean, how much is Aave supposed to be worth? How much is Compound supposed to be worth? How much are these platforms supposed to be worth? And the answer is, when you can value it like a real business, not very much. So I'm still, look, I'm still stuck on the idea that you can make a lot of money investing in good products in crypto if you invest at good valuations. Obviously, this is super obvious. If you can do pre-seed, if you can do angel, if you can get your money in or get into a fair launch early, early product with a great team, then you can make a lot of money if it's a good product. And it's probably, it's a safe, it's a safer bet, right? So the way that I think about it is if you can invest at a cutting edge lending protocol at a 25 million valuation or, you know, 50 million valuation as it comes out, then yeah, maybe it'll get to 500 million, maybe it'll get to 600 million and you're probably not going to lose that much money on it if it's run by a good team in the same way that it doesn't matter how good a team is for a meme coin, you can easily lose money on it if there's just no appetite for it. The upside just isn't, isn't there the same way. And so that's why the crypto native people aren't, aren't going for it. But I still think it's a, you know, slow and steady wins the race. You know, if you want to build wealth over time, you still, you're just supposed to invest in good products and crypto and just sit on them and not, not think about them. And then you can have some sort of, some sort of meme allocation. But I think in aggregate, uh, what, what's happening right now is that, uh, you know, there's just, the, 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 the interest just isn't there. I mean, but look, at the end of the day, we'll see. I mean, right now we're talking about this is Bitcoin. Bitcoin sold off five percent today, uh, which is you know pretty, it's pretty 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 uh, pretty good move for BTC. We we tried to get through that seventy three k level, then we tried to get through the seventy two k level, and now we're back at now we're back at sixty six. And I think we've both been we're both we both been bullish, but a little bit more cautious around these levels in the short term, just because I think things did get very overheated and there is a lot of open interest in the market. However, at this, at this point, I, I'm seeing, I'm seeing so many indications that are bullish for BTC. I mean, just the geopolitics in general is, is a phenomenal for, 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 for Bitcoin. The world, the world is becoming a much more dangerous place today. And so more than, more than ever, I want to hold on to BTC for the long run. I, I agree. Um, I, you know, we were chatting about this offline. Everybody who's holding BTC on a on a cold wallet should educate themselves on downloading the private key and spending it. If Ledger disappears or Trezor disappears, like you should, you should really learn the mechanics of what you're holding because increasingly it looks like we live in a world where you you may just need to pack up stuff in your little go bag and move, <laughs> you know. Um, I, I don't know if low probability today about how e e Iran is looking at potentially locking, launching rockets at Israel. Yeah, no, nobody wants that. Like, even if you don't care about the Middle East at all and it's just not part of your reality, like that, that's just that's just going to draw in a lot of problems. So, yeah, I think it's it the the like the geopolitical aspect of Bitcoin. It has never been more relevant, especially in especially in the developing world. Um, the meme coin thing, it's the best casino in the history of the world. Your odds are better than betting it all on double zero. Like I get, I get that. And yeah, you know, we don't need to beat a dead horse, but everything else in between is a bit of a head scratcher. Maybe Avi, I, you know, both of us tweeted out, both of us tweeted out, like, what should we talk about this week? Should we do a lightning round where like I ask you questions that people replied to yours and you ask me questions that people replied to mine and we try to answer in like 
short, short little sound bites. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So Jonah, what do you think about the death of NFTs? Why aren't NFTs doing well? I think that, that Blur just brought in, you, you know how like Cardano doesn't go to zero, right? I think Blur made the bad NFT projects go to zero. The fads go to zero. Like they brought some liquidity in there, uh, some selling. They made it possible, right? And so anything that's blurrable got blurred. Uh, you know, that obviously didn't hurt the best projects or the grails, like fucking CryptoPunk traded for $16 million two weeks ago. But I think that's why they're getting torched because finally somebody figured out a way to devalue worthless things. Um, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I I also think that meme coins just took the wind out of the sails. I think the meme, meme coins are the NFTs of this cycle, right? They offer They offer you community. They offer you outsized returns. They are highly correlated to the performance of the base asset. All these things are reasons why people bought NFTs in the first place. And people were using NFTs to just mass- massively speculate on them. And uh, then I think what ended up what ended up happening is that meme coins just took the wind out of the sails for these guys. And so even the NFT projects that are doing really good work, I mean, Pudgy Penguins is actually building a real brand. Yeah, I saw them in a I saw them in a like a department store for yeah, sale. They're, they're building they're building a real brand and I think that they're going to be around for a very long time. But the the issue is that the the crypto native people just aren't aren't buying them and those are the only people that are that are that are interested right now. So I I do think that there's probably going to be a renaissance at some point in the next 6 months. That would be my at least that that would be my guess. And so I like holding on to lart, you know, good NFTs, you know, squiggles, pudgies. Obviously, I love my rock. I think crypto <laughs> punks are gonna are, are gonna do well. I think that we are gonna capture the culture again at some point in the future. It's just it's just a matter of time. But for now, you know, they're they're not gonna give you so they're not gonna give you crazy returns. I I really don't think Blur hurt NFTs as much as the market says that they did. I think they did at the margin by providing liquidity, as you said. But I think the prices would have been reached anyway. People would have sold anyway. Yeah, it just would have taken a, it would have been like a slow bleed instead of like a quick price discovery followed by equilibrium type thing. Um, Here, I got one for you. Uh, Price targets for potential dips uh, to buy and levels for take profit. Well, these these people, they just want to plan, huh? So one thing, I I mean, I actually think this is the 66K level is a good level to play, to play for a bounce. I think that it's very likely that we range between 60 and 70 K for a bit. Um, and so my, 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 my view here is you probably, you know, I, I hope you de-risked a little bit around 70 K because what you see in the chart right now and what you see in the market is that when we first, we first hit, you know, 73, we sold off really hard back down to 60. We came back up and now we've rejected again at that 70, at that 70 K level. Normally what you want to, what you want to do is if you go to the daily chart, uh, look at starting on Monday, March 25th, you see a green candle and there's a wick. And then the next day there's a wick. And then the next day there's a wick. And then the next day there's a wick. So you get four different days in a row where you can't break through a certain supply level. And that should tell you, okay, maybe there isn't enough buying pressure to get through this particular level. And that the crazy bid that occurred before isn't here anymore. And so I should you should start to think about de-risking in those types of situations. And so now you have an even greater reason to de-risk. So the reason that I think that it's possible we could, you know, trade down to 52K from here. And that would be my, you know, if we trade 52K, that's my I'm I'm fucking buying the shit and I'm going, I'm going in, I'm going ham. Going shopping. Uh, I'm going, I'm going shopping at 52K. Is we have few things happening one is we finally have our first lower lower high so if you just look at the if you just look at the chart you'll you'll see that you'll see that pretty pretty simply and then the second thing is we're in the process of breaking the trend line that's been active since since 40k so we've just been steadily climbing and what these two things are telling me is that we finally reached a point where people are willing to offload enough supply to counteract to counteract the inflows and that Bitcoin can get very reflexive on the way down. There are a lot of people sitting on unrealized profits. Right now, when you look at 
a market like this and you think to yourself, well, it's going to be pretty hard to get over 73K, that makes the risk reward really bad uh, for holding. And so you generally tend to drift towards places where it's difficult to figure out a risk reward. And right now it's easy because look, you have really the next support level is at 50, as at 53K. You kind of have one at, at 62, but it's been tested too many times. And I think a lot of people, a lot of people bought those levels already. And so the, the area that makes the most sense that is quote unquote tough to determine what, you know, uh, t- t- tough to determine whether it's good or bad risk reward is just smack dab, smack dab in the middle, you know, at that, at that 61 K level, a, a, you know, you, then you have that 73 K top and the 52 K bottom. And so I think that's probably where we just end up for a bit. We probably get stuck there for a while. I, I have a slightly different take than you. I think that's super interesting. Um, I, I just, I, you, you were the voice of reason when we hit all time highs, you were like, it, it probably makes sense to take a little off trade around the position. I was just euphorically bullish. I, I, I didn't expect this. Um, but what I would say is I, I think to the downside, yeah, if we trade down to 50 K it's time to go shopping. Like you close your eyes and you buy with both hands around here. I think you're supposed to look for, you know, also for down at 50 K, maybe you try to buy some Solana, if it's, you know, if it's around 150 or something, um, I don't know about ETH, Bitcoin and Solana are probably what you buy. Uh, to the upside, oh, I, thought, I thought you were Mr. ETH bull. What happened? Don't want to buy I, any ETH. I'm a little bit. Jonah? I don't know. I've, did I've got I, did I bear fudge you too hard? You, you may have, dude. I, I, I'm long enough. Like I'm, I'm. You've scared me. I don't want to buy more at this point. Definitely not selling any ETH though. Just hanging on to that one. I think Solana, I'm under allocated. So how about this? You buy Bitcoin and you buy things that you're under allocated to. Like in my case, Solana. If you're like long to your ears in Solana and you don't have any ETH, maybe you buy some ETH on a on a pullback to 50K as well as Bitcoin. Um, to the upside, uh, I just think it's insane to sell before the halving. And like... I think we've, you know, you're talking about these wicks, the gut, like we, we got our answer on why it's, why it's wicking. Like the government has shown up with their Silk Road Bitcoin and they're just, mm-hmm. you know, f- f- funding, funding America's operations, paying for bridges that fell into the water and government salaries and stuff. Like the, the Silk Road Bitcoin is hitting the market here, it seems. So they're, they're sending it mm-hmm. to Coinbase. So ultimately like, You've got a big seller. You've also got lots of buying. The market's kind of between a rock and a hard place. And then the halving's coming up and the miners are going to have literally half as much selling to do. So stock and flow dynamics, I think, should bring us to higher levels. I don't really see, I don't have a take profit level in price space. I have it in MVRVZ space. Uh, MVRVZ, for those of you who aren't aware, is a Z scored, i.e. like number of standard, like standard deviation striated like metric where you look at the market cap of Bitcoin divided by the realized cap, which is defined as like the price at which all the UTXOs were spent, uh, volume, volume weighted, like realized price and go look up the blog post. I don't really know how to articulate it. This is like a mathematical equation. It's, it's really a really good predictor of cycle lows and cycle highs. Um, when MVRVZ gets to seven, that's when I'm going to be selling ass loads of Bitcoin. Um, I see no reason to like pick a price ahead of that. You sort of have to watch where the transactions get spent so you can determine that realized value. Um, so that's kind of where, how I'm thinking about it. Yeah, it's, it's de- definitely definitely a good long term approach. I think these metrics are good are, are good for trying to time cycle tops. And I'm not, by no means calling the top of the cycle, but I am saying that the next three weeks are going to be pretty shitty, dicey. Yeah. They're gonna, they're gonna, they're 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 they're, they're not gonna be good. So if, if if I'm you, I'm consolidating my gains. So that brings me to a great lightning round question. Some guy uh, tweeted at you, "Where are we in the cycle?" We are inning seven. That's my guess. I think, you know, we're sorry, inning 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 six. What I would say is that we probably don't get. We probably don't get past. 100k until the end of the year 
Uh, so I think what 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 ends up what ends up happening is that we have the sell off. This probably lasts for a month or two. Uh, then we make a run up to you know, 80, 80 to 95 K. I don't think that we break hundred K the first time that we get close. I think that too many people come in sell off. Then we get another few months of, then we get another few months of sideways. And then some point next year, we break through that, that hundred K level. We have a crazy run, maybe up to 120, 130, 140. And then that's it. And then we're done. That's my bet. Do the memes participate uh, once we break through 80 K? I think, I think memes just continue to run for the next, six months, but with multiple 80% drawdowns in between, right? So if it, for example, if, if Bitcoin, if Bitcoin trades 52 K, which I think there's a reasonable chance it does in the next two months, every meme is going to be absolutely destroyed. And that's actually probably a really good time to start buying them. Interesting. And where, where does all the money get made? Which innings does all the money get made? Like, let's, let's say, I mean, dude, the, the, a lot of the money was made already, I think. I, I don't think it's crystallized. But, I think it's it's still sitting in there. But we still need we still need our we still need our crazy AI bubble. Like we need our first AI coin to hit fifty billion, as as people think it's you know as people think it's a future. And I think we need Doge to probably hit fifty to seventy five billion. We we need Doge to test all time highs, uh, and then and then I'll start to think about taking off a lot. Yeah, I, I'm just I'm like heavily fixated on MBRVZ. But I, I'm sure there are better ways to do this, and, and you probably know what they are. I mean, this this has been a weird cycle. Like the sell off was so ferocious and all encompassing and terrifying, and like sprinkled with regulatory jalapenos that fucking burn your face off if you try to take a bite. Um, and then it just came roaring the fuck back, like so quickly. I can't help but wonder if this isn't going to conform to the normal psychologic of havings and four years, two of which are bear, two of which are bull. Like this one, this one feels like it could be a little runt cycle characterized by crazy meme coins. Then another like sell off of apathy followed by like a plateau of enlightenment where real world use cases start to take off. I think that's, I, I, I think that's probably right. Actually. I mean, I, I tend to agree with you that we're probably past the idea of cycles. Yeah, we've gotten, we've, we've graduated from this and that what we're going to see is we're just going to see a slow, consistent growth from Bitcoin over the next five years with a lot of minus 40% drawdowns in between. Long and strong. It's the way to play it. Long and strong. Buy 52K with me, boys. It, it's, maybe we could close on a brief anecdote. Um, my, I, I, my one sort of like artwork splurge, there's this guy, Bran Simonson. He's like an ex-British Marine guy who got shot with an AK-47 in Afghanistan. And now he's an artist. He um, he covers weapons and butterflies. And they're pretty awesome. Um, check them out, Bran Simonson. Anyway, he was asking me for crypto trading advice. And my advice to him was stick to what you what you know. Like don't try to develop a side hustle like day trading meme coins or or, um, you know, attempting to hop onto this or that technology narrative. And it got me thinking, like, how do we develop an edge as traders of this market? And ultimately, what I got him onto was memes, because that's something that as an artist, he can understand. And he can also sell his artwork for ETH or Bitcoin or whatever, and, and just, uh, like, stay long, because he understands price appreciation from developing artwork. Uh, the, all of the software heavy stuff in the middle L2s, like Arbitrum Optimism, Polygon, like he's not, I, I advised him away from that. And I was just thinking like, maybe as crypto traders, we should all try to find like something we can relate to, to trade. Cause it's often, there's so many little pockets of this space that are just a bit spooky and hard to understand. I, I, my brain starts to melt with the AI and the software stuff. I don't get it, but holding on for dear life and the commodities angles. Like I, I can totally get that. And memes like, you know, as a podcaster learning from you, Avi, like we, we are starting to understand virality a bit. So I, meme coins make sense. I don't know. What, what's so your solid. area? Ever, ever. I don't, I don't know if I can follow it up, follow it up with, uh, with, with, with much, but I mean, for, for me, look at the, uh, at the end of the day, I got into this because 
I think that crypto has the opportunity to change the world. And so I do spend a lot of time thinking about the actual real applications of this space. I'm just a trader and I'm cognizant that my job is to make money and I need to go where the money is. So I pay attention, I research, I look, I invest, but at the end of the day right now, I'm a trader. And so that's why I'm not super invested. <laughs> <laughs> well, stay safe out there, everybody. It's getting choppy. Uh, none of this is investment advice. Be careful, do your own research. And Avi, great talking to you, man. Pleasure talking to you too, Jenna. Take care.